sorry, my video isn't on, but uh, can't do that, but I'm um, able to talk. So Dr. Brad Looking Bell um, is our speaker today. Um, welcome. Um, he, uh, he's a distinguished professor um, in the humanities department at Columbia College. And I would love for him to tell me the background of his name, because it's a pretty fascinating name for me. Um, he got, he's a Midwesterner from what I can see. He got his BA at Southwestern Oklahoma State University and his MA and his PhD at the University of Toledo, which I believe is in Ohio. Um, is that correct? Um, and uh, he's the author of multiple books, which I hope he'll talk about and a contributor to several anthologies, encyclopedias and journal. He recently competed the American Military, a narrative history. Um, and that was in 2013. Um, we're really looking si excited and to have you here today. Um, and I'll let you take it from here. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you for those, those uh, words. And uh, I, I, can everybody hear me fine? Yes, you sound great. Great. I, I put on my uh, airplane pilot ears and the microphone. I, I haven't put this thing on in, in a couple of years. You, you all may remember the days of pandemic shutdowns and COVID. And, and I still have sort of mental anguish every time I put these on because I remember, you know, what that was like. Uh, uh, so I haven't been uh, uh, part of a Zoom uh, event in, in a bit. So you know, forgive me if I make some mistakes with the technology here, but I do have a slideshow that I'll probably share here. Uh, and, uh, you know, if you can't see a slide and I'm referencing it, you know, just let me know. I can, you know, back up and uh, that sort of thing. But uh, uh, as long as I can find my buttons to share a screen, I've got a, another screen over here on the left side, which uh, I have some notes. So I, I may look over here sometimes and look uh, forward to, to each of you here. I, I, I hope uh, that... Um, uh, you don't mind that uh, I, I will be talking for about five hours. Um, no, I'm, I'm kidding. I, I'm not going to do that. But uh, uh, forgive me if I, I get a little long-winded. I tried to pare my notes down just a bit. Uh, th this topic uh, was something we sort of kind of threw together. And maybe some of this was based on my Civil War class from last semester. And I had some, you know how this is, if you've ever been a teacher, didn't get to everything I wanted to get to at the end of the semester. So these are some of the, the topics that I, I really didn't get to fully address after the Civil War. Uh, that I'd hoped to do in my class last semester. So you you get to be uh, part of that uh, continuing class uh, from the spring semester, and I appreciate you. Any feedback you have or questions, I, I'm probably not the expert in, in any stretch of the imagination, but you know I I, I can uh, perhaps listen to you with, if you have some comments or some ideas. Uh, uh, about the topic. Uh, free labor ideology and party realignment after the American Civil War. I think that's what we settled on. There's probably uh, uh, a great deal of interest in continuing this kind of theme into the 20th century, uh, but I'm, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to stay in the 19th century like most historians, it's like, you know, we kind of get into our periods and our eras and we say, okay, we got to stay focused uh, so uh, uh, there are generalizations, if we have any political scientists in the group, uh, there are political, sci uh, political scientists who have talked about these generalizations that go beyond a particular period uh, uh, of history. But, but I'm going to stay focused on the period, you know, the Civil War in the 19th century and, and the aftermath of the Civil War, uh, and maybe say something at the end to kind of stretch that forward. But uh, um, let me do a screen share here. If it's going to work, I'm going to pull up my PowerPoint Hopefully you can see that. That looks fine. Good. I'll do it like that. Okay. Hopefully that's good. All right. Uh, well, again, good afternoon and thank you uh, for having me, uh, inviting me here to be with you. Uh, you. You may look at my first slide and think that I'm at the wrong place, but uh, uh, perhaps uh, I can connect all, all the dots uh, with you in just a few minutes. We want to try to answer the question, you know, how did the, uh, the two parties, Republican and Democratic, switch platforms and positions during the 1800s? I I'm Professor Brad Lookingbill of Columbia College, where I've worked for the last 
27 years as a historian. Um, I, I, I do get questions about my name sometimes, uh, you know, so if, if you're interested. Uh, uh, I, I don't have the answer. Uh, I guess there's something ironic about a historian who doesn't know anything about his own history. But, you know, I, I give you a long story sometime if you you, you want to chat about uh, the looking bills uh, uh, from the past. But I grew up in Oklahoma uh, and some of the looking bills, you know, trace back to uh, Georgia, North Carolina, Tennessee. Uh, but I didn't spend much time around the looking bills when I was a kid. So I really never had the chance to you know, interview them. My, my father was an alcoholic. So uh, that sort of thing, my parents divorced. And so I, I didn't really know my father very well. So there's a, you know, kind of long story there, but I just don't have uh, all the answers, but I do know that their genealogy traces back uh, through uh, the antebellum South uh, and, and before the, uh, before, of course, the period of time we're talking about uh, today, I suppose. Now, when I was a college student many years ago, I a professor told me to begin every talk with a bit of humor. Uh, are you ready for my dad jokes? Uh, well, here we go. When I was a child, uh, my father once sat me on his knee. Someday, he said, we'll, we'll buy a second chair. I don't know. It's, that's my, one of my dad jokes. See, I think with the dad jokes, you're supposed to kind of groan. You don't really laugh. You just groan. Um, one of the things I did learn from my father was the meaning of the word plethora. Uh, it still means a lot to me now. Uh, see, I, I got a lot of these dad jokes. I, uh, being a father is one of my great, great honors in life. So uh, my children have to endure my sense of humor. But in order to address a complex historical question, please allow me to kind of compress uh, a plethora of factors that shape party realignment into a singularity, the free labor ideology. Uh, let me start at the beginning. Before the Civil War, Americans expressed outrage about the faltering Whigs and the factionalized Democrats. More than 30 politicians met at a schoolhouse in Ripon, Wisconsin on February 28, 1854 to form a third party. Thereafter, the Free Soilers, Know Nothings, former Whigs, ex-Democrats, uh, all began to call themselves uh, Republicans. Oops. According to the free labor ideology of the Republican Party, freedom advanced, freedom advanced the dignity and the status of the average worker. Breadwinners succeeded or failed based on their own productivity in the marketplace. Uh, bondage produced only stagnation, or so Republicans posited. The virtues of free labor resonated with the anti-slavery claims of liberal contract theory, which, re which repudiated the power of oligarchy to control society. Scores of voters supported an economic agenda for higher tariffs, central banking, internal improvements. There a whole bunch of literature has been written about each of these parts of the Republican platform uh, of the 1850s. Uh, homestead laws, that probably that's the biggest plank in the platform, homestead laws, uh, all rooted around the idea that the federal government should play a stronger role, right, uh, in protecting the rights uh, of citizens. By by permitting slavery where it existed in certain states, but opposing its extension westward, and by keeping territories free and leaving race relations elsewhere undisturbed, Republicans managed to propose legal limits that pleased farmers and mechanics, but not slave traders and planters. For their first presidential contest in 1856, John C. Fremont, was nominated by Republicans with the cry, free soil, free labor, free men, and Vermont. I, I, I don't know if they put it on a bumper sticker, right? Uh, or if they put it on a, a red trucker hat or anything like that, but, but you know, it was quite a slogan that sort of captured the essence uh, of freedom uh, at the heart of the Republican ideology at the time. 
Uh, and, and I'm not going to do the finger quotes every time. I, you know, some of these are quotes. Uh, I, I find it annoying, all the finger quotes. But but uh, if anybody, you know, wants, wants me to uh, kind of get into the, the actual quotations or so you kind of think about words that have two meanings, you know, free, right? Maybe even free should be put in quote in the 19th century every time we talk about it because it wasn't an, uh, an inclusive term for every person, right? Uh, uh, but so I won't do the finger quotes, but maybe uh, uh, it's implied or understood sometimes. The United States reckoned with black chattel slavery during the election of 1860. The Democratic Party divided largely between voters supporting the so-called popular sovereignty of Illinois Senator Stephen Douglas. I'll try to move this to the next slide here. And, and other Democrats uh, uh, celebrated the pro-slavery stance of Vice President John Breckinridge of Kentucky. Since neither Douglas nor Breckinridge would block the adoption of slave slave codes in every state and Western territory, Republican presidential candidate Abraham Lincoln considered all of them, all of the Democrats, a threat to the future of free labor. In America, he insisted that slave codes must be prohibited by the federal government in the in the Kansas Nebraska Territory specifically, which represented a core belief of Republican candidates in an era of uh, manifest destiny. Republicans opined the moral indifference of the democracy towards the enslavement of workers would not require white Northerners formally to approve of black chattel, black chattel slavery, but simply to acquiesce in its expansion, a result made possible by the racial bigotry prevalent North as well as South of the Mason-Dixon line. Once accomplished at the ballot box, this is the way the theory worked, the, the legal groundwork work would prevent Northern states from continuing to stop the spread of unfreedom by statutory law or judicial decree. Hence, Advancing the free labor ideology represented the best way to reverse a trend towards the nationalization of unfree labor. In the throes of the Civil War, President Lincoln placed the struggle to save the Union within the familiar context then of the free labor ideology. Slavery, he insisted, embodied the idea that the condition of the worker would remain forever free. In the North, he posited, there was no such thing as a free man fixed for life in the condition of a hired laborer, he said. Men with their families work for themselves on their farms, in their houses, in their shops, taking the whole product to themselves. I'm probably not doing justice to a Lincoln accent here. Uh, and asking no favors of capital on the one hand, nor of hired laborers or slaves on the other. Republicans known as radicals regarded Honest Abe as too soft on the South, uh, thwarting his renomination in 1864. Nevertheless, he promoted the vice presidential, vice presidential nomination of Andrew Johnson on a national union ticket. His maneuvering succeeded and he won a second term. All, you know, and this is again, a poster from 1864. I've, I've seen it sometimes used in textbooks for the election of 1860, but of course that would be a mistake. Uh, Hannibal Hamlin, a, a Republican was the vice presidential running mate of, of Lincoln in, in the election of 1860. In 1864, it was Andrew Johnson. And you can see here the national union banner uh, on many states, the ballot didn't read Republican, it read uh, Union uh, in 1864 uh, as Lincoln. And you can see this little symbol here. Uh, here's kind of this laborer, the plowman, the working man, you know, Lincoln and Andrew Johnson, who happened to have been a former tailor, right, a working man from Tennessee. Uh, you know, this sort of epitomizes the free labor ideology in 1864. Of course, the clash of arms in the war of settled the dispute over free labor ultimately. Uh, and it also strengthened tendencies that transformed a society of small producers from which the ideology had sprung and undermined the assumptions on which it rested. The Republican Party thus 
emphasized an egalitarian vision of individual human potential and related it to the profound ideological conviction that anyone could climb the ladder of success with toil and discipline. The concept accentuated the image of a self-made man as the foil of a slave power conspiracy. However, only a handful of Democrats at the time seemed responsive to the symbolism of free labor. Uh, certainly before 1865, the Democratic movement, you know, tying back to old Andrew Jackson, you know, uh, didn't seem as responsive to the ideology. There, there are exceptions. We can, and if you're a political scientist, you can dig down county by county, uh, state by state, and find uh, where uh, Democratic voters actually uh, may have been intrigued by this, this ideology too. But just generally speaking, before 1865, Democratic voters uh, seem to be following a different uh, ideological pathway, right? But the Democratic Party did endorse in 1865 the 13th Amendment to the Constitution. Um, alternative systems of labor slowly emerged to take the place of black chattel slavery, you know, from sea to shining sea. Most workers after the Civil War became wage earning employees, not independent farmers or, or factory owners. Now, in 1865, Congress established the Bureau of Refugees, Freedmen, and Abandoned Lands. It became known commonly as the Freedmen's Bureau. Under the direction of General Oliver Otis Howard, Howard, he's the namesake for Howard University today, uh, it, it tried to settle disputes between landholders and ex-slaves while dispensing aid and, and rations regardless of race. You must begin at the bottom of the ladder and climb up, Howard once told an African-American audience. Although members of Congress discussed giving freedmen homesteads, 40 acres and a mule, their plans were replaced or set aside uh, with arranged rentals and uh, stifling contracts. Southern landlords supplied them with a shack and a chance to share a portion of the staple crop upon harvest. Of course, few of the sharecroppers were able to earn enough profit to ever buy their own land. Scarcity of capital led to the crop lien system, wherein local stores owned by planters and merchants loaned food, clothing, seed, farm implements for high interest and, a, and another claim uh, on the crops. You can see the, the share of the sharecroppers keeps shrinking over time. Sadly, the declining yields and the mounting debt created a, a cycle of dependency among sharecroppers. Some turned to the newly arising mill towns to escape. Too many experienced incarcerations uh, others became exodusters, heading westward in search of promised lands. Republican Ulysses S. Grant was the popular embodiment of a working class hero. Winning the election of 1868 with the slogan, let us have peace. Only 46 years of age at the time of his inauguration, he was the youngest president to assume the office. Of course, later, you know, Teddy Roosevelt and John F. Kennedy were younger, uh, but at the time it was pretty astonishing. I mean, kind of think about all the, all the images you've seen probably in your, your old grade school classrooms uh, on the walls uh, that teachers put up all these sort of old gray-headed gentleman uh, holding the presidency. So Grant was, a, was quite a contrast at the time uh, as a 46-year-old. And of course, he was a war hero and, and beloved by the Grand Army of the Republic. Unfortunately, he seemed awestruck by the moneyed interests. The crafty Jay Gould and the con man James Fisk connived with the president's brother-in-law to corner the nation's gold market. His secretary of war was impeached for bribery, but resigned in time to avoid 
a Senate trial. Stalwart Republicans became implicated in the financial crookery of the Credit Mobier, as well as the Whiskey Ring. Grant's peace policy spawned conflicts on Indian reservations and malfeasance by federal agents. Nothing angered party members more than Grant's zeal to annex the Dominican Republic. The Republican-controlled Senate rejected his treaty in 1871 when a vote by Republicans mustered only a 28 to 28 tie for annexation. And you can see in this poster, this is actually from 1872, but you can see Grant is depicted here, right, as the Galena Tanner and his vice presidential candidate in 1872 you know, it was Henry Wilson of Massachusetts. He's depicted here as a shoemaker, right? So again, there's this sort of working man's uh, iconography, right? At the vanguard of the backlash against Grant and against kind of wasteful spending, corrupt bureaucracies and, and high taxes, a Republican cohort wanted to end the policies of reconstruction. Reformers such as DeWitt Center of Tennessee and B. Gratz Brown and Carl Schurz of Missouri initially won governorships and Senate seats as a result of their collaboration with, quote, bourbon Democrats. Of course, they made Faustian bargains. In early 1872, Brown and Schurz called for a liberal Republican convention. I know for some of us today, we might say that's an oxymoron, a liberal Republican. I don't even know what that means. Okay? But this was a, a phrase in 1872 popularized by, by Schurz and others. The liberal Republicans defined their goals as amnesty for ex-Confederates, free trade, civil service reform. And, and, the, and this may see, whenever I talk about this in class, a lot of students really just kind of doze off at this point, but start talking about the, the redemption of greenbacks with gold, right? Oh boy, that's, you know, monetary policy, even today makes, uh, makes the eyes glaze over, right? Um, so these are some of the issues that the liberal Republicans championed in, in 1872. One of the icons of the old Adams family, again, that has nothing to do with <laughs> Adams family today, uh, but Charles Francis Adams, who had been uh, Lincoln's ambassador to Great Britain during the war, he echoed the criticism uh, of, quote, Grantism. A number of radicals joined them, including Illinois Senator Lyman Trumbull, Indiana's ex-congressman George Julian, and even Charles Sumner of Massachusetts. The liberal Republicans that May nominated New York Tribune editor Horace Greeley for president, tapping Brown as his running mate, no longer waving the bloody shirt, but instead the dirty laundry. Their crusade did not avert Grant's second term. Republicans doubted the free labor ideology after the Panic of 1873. John Emery Bryant, a union veteran, former Freedmen's Bureau agent, and a member of the Georgia House of Representatives, wrote a New York Times article on April 26, 1875, about his adopted state of Georgia. Though born in Maine, he became a carpetbagger of conscience in the New South. The policies of reconstruction, he insisted, revealed the same issue that had brought on the Civil War in the first place, he said. The struggle between two systems of labor. Northerners felt that the laboring man should be as independent as a capitalist, he said. Southern elites, he admitted, still believed that workers ought to be slaves. Although overstated a bit, Bryant's analysis underscored the centrality of labor relations after the Civil War. Evidently, he was no longer in step, though, with the grand old party. Was it still an article of faith among Republicans that all laborers should be as independent as capitalists? As one of Bryant's northern friends, Robbins Little scribed in a letter to uh, Bryant that, quote, there was a reason to believe, he said, that the attitudes toward the labor question and the general view of society and government held by the South's old ruling class were now substantially shared by a large class in the North. 
only a few years earlier, he said, Republicans had united in the determination to remake the country in accordance with a free labor ideology. Now, uh, the working class found itself with few friends in high places. Over the years, the labor movement pursued a working men's democracy. Three national unions survived the Civil War, and the number had grown to 21 by 1870. Furthermore, local unions existed in cities throughout the country. Strikes became a regular feature of bread and butter unionism. To the reigning economic orthodoxy that preached the virtues of acquisition and the iron law of wages, organizers for labor responded with an ethic of solidarity on the shop floor. Even more popular was the demand for legislation reducing working hours, an issue that mobilized craftsmen and mechanics alike. Instead of viewing the workday as only an economic experience, the rank and file invested it with utopian meanings, seeing shorter hours as a reform that would enable workers to devote more time to citizenship. Eight hours for work, eight hours for rest, eight hours for what you will, was their cry. Time would bring years of stalemate following the election of 1876. As Republican Rutherford B. Hayes lacked an ideological mandate as president. One of the, the nicknames, some of you know, but this, this is a topic we could spend uh, a great deal of time analyzing. Uh, one of the topics was the, the, the level of voter fraud in the 1876 presidential election. And you can see this on my uh, map. I've got many of these, but uh, uh, the, the disputed votes and, and disputes over who should count the votes in certain states, especially in Florida, South Carolina, uh, Louisiana, and Oregon, uh, this, this threatened to undermine uh, the, the final uh, electoral count uh, from the election results, and, and it resulted in a, a sort of bargain made in Congress in February of 1877. You probably learned this in school. It's called the Compromise of 1877 or the Bargain of 1877, in which Rutherford B. Hayes was declared the winner based on the, uh, his 185 electoral votes, and uh, Democrat Samuel Tilden uh, came up just one vote short. You can see that on the map there, but but this led to you know four years of nicknames of what they called him his fraudulency, rather fraud, rather fraud, behaves right. Uh, so a lot of the media at the time, the newspapers, the press, you know, played up the idea of fraud after the election of 1876. But if you look at this map closely, and 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 I can flip back and forth if you like, go back to the election of 1860, and you and you see really a, a still very profound. Uh, line, if you will, between the North and the South. New York and New Jersey are tilting toward the Democrats. And you can see Republicans are trying, you know, by 1876 to make inroads among uh, Southerners, especially uh, with the Black vote secured by the 15th Amendment. Uh, but, but, you know, it, it was highly unstable and, 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 it really, uh, and it really resulted in a kind of stalemate uh, in politics for for decades. It was not until 1896 that 1896 that champions of free labor would march back into the arena of national politics again. Now, even though Democrat Grover Cleveland had signed a law uh, two years earlier that made Labor Day a national holiday. Until then, the same party would control both houses of Congress only three times during that span of time, and only twice would the same party control both the White House and the Congress, uh, and this just lasted really for two years. So the federal government would find itself all but paralyzed during this period uh, we often refer to as the Gilded Age in American history. Um, all, uh, important bills would be shuttled back and forth between committees, chambers, and branches. State and local politics often hinged on 
what we call the boss system. Uh, the Supreme Court moved in a uh, conservative direction. Partisanship stymied change during America's gilded age. The realignment of the Democratic and Republican parties gradually pushed forward a wave of what we call populism and progressivism around the turn of the 20th century. I guess I should change my slide one more time here. This is from the election of 1896. You can again see the North-South divide in this uh, election of 1896. William McKinley, the Republican, William Jennings Bryan, the Democrat, and also Bryan was nominated by the Populist Party in that same election. Uh, but Bryan does, as you see, have a lot of support out in the Western states. Uh, and that's kind of one of the moves the Republicans, uh, excuse me, that the Democrats were, were making under Bryan as they were broadening out their appeal uh, beyond the South, right? And this sort of Midwestern populism uh, is, is, is sort of complicated and it doesn't necessarily result necessarily in electoral votes. If you, you do the counting, <laughs> take Montana, and of course, it's, this is even a debate today, you know, how many electoral votes should each of these states have, right? Uh, take Montana, or there's Wyoming with three, you know, it, it does create sometimes disparities, uh, because the populations in these places uh, are, are rather small. Uh, but as you see, Brian uh, is making gains in the West, but he's not necessarily gaining a lot of electoral votes. These are, you know, again, Michigan, Ohio. These are the these are prime states. You can see in New York again, uh, Pennsylvania. These are the states that uh, were highly contested in in what in those days was referred to as the industrial belt uh, or the, the the center of manufacturing in the Gilded Age. Uh, and so McKinley won in 1896. Um, but you can see there there is a sort of a, a movement we call it populism. Some, sometimes after the 20th century, referred to it as progressivism. There's a lot of synergy between populists and progressives, but progressives tend to be more located, as you probably know, right, in urban areas, whereas the populists tended to be more rural, just as a generalization. It's not really until the onset of the Great Depression, right? The high tide of what we call fair labor standards in the 1930s under Democrat President Franklin D. Roosevelt and his new deal. It's not really until then that you can see, as, as my you know, map indicates, a dramatic change. Uh, that's when the realignment really comes full circle because at the center of Roosevelt's new deal, right, were you know, important planks in the democratic platform, in 1932, 1936, and again in 1940, related to labor. Social security, fair labor standards, minimum wages. I mean, we could go down the list of things. Uh, the New Deal in the 1930s really is where you can see the full materialization, right, of uh, a realignment regarding the, the free labor standards. So uh, my, my screen here, I, I can jump around if we want, but uh, to kind of take it back. Uh, in effect, the party of FDR replaced the uh, the party of Lincoln in the hearts and minds of, of most breadwinners. Um, and kind of paraphrasing a, a, the closing line from a 1942 film, FDR might have quipped, I think this is the beginning of a beautiful relationship uh, to laborers. Right? Uh, of course, that suggests a fascinating conversation, right? You know, for another day. Um, but but I'll, I'll leave that <laughs> alone and, and kind of try to stop here thereabouts. So th thank you for your attention. You know, are, are there you know comments or questions? I, I have some props here. You know, I can wave around. You know, I, I know nothing. I just repeat what I read in books. This is Eric Foner's book. Uh, free soil, free labor, yeah. free men. Free soil, free labor, free men. Right. Uh, this is a classic book, and I've often assigned it to my classes. Uh, Eric Foner is a professor at uh, Columbia University. Actually, he's a retired professor now at Columbia University. Uh, and, and maybe this is another source. If you kind of want to track this out and track this out a little bit later. But uh, again, I know nothing. I just repeat what I read. Uh, this is uh, Heather Cox Richardson's uh, she's, she has several of these really good books. Some of you may follow her. She shares a lot uh, of her blogs. Uh, uh, this is called How the South Won the Civil War. 
uh, and I, I don't agree with her on every point, but I, I, I do find her writing so so compelling and, and her analysis uh, cogent. So uh, I, I lean a lot on her. Uh, and this this book in particular kind of traces these debates into the 20th and 21st century, uh, particularly in regard to the rights of working people. Uh, so those are just a couple of sources to throw at you. D do you have any comments or, or thoughts or questions? Uh, yes, sir. Dr. Rookin Bill, uh, first of all, I guess we're through, we can unshare the screen, but so we can see, we can see you better. Uh, so, um, Pam Springsteel asked earlier, uh, how did Oregon get to split its vote in the 1876 election? And then I saw looked at another one of the screens you published, showed later, California had one split off. So I'm not familiar with those. Can you explain how that happened, how they got some part of their electoral votes split? Oh, I love it. The answer is no, I can't explain. <laughs> uh, but you're asking the great questions. You've stumped me. Then that's pretty easy to do sometimes. But uh, but that that is is something I'm going to try to investigate a bit. I had had uh, noticed, and you probably see this in other elections from time to time. I have noticed that in some of my electoral maps in different presidential election years, uh, the splitting of votes. Uh, that there was uh, a case like that back in 1860 as well. Um, and it had to do with Douglas and, and Breckenridge and Lee. So, I, you know, I don't know how that played out, but you'll find that in, in maps over the years. And so uh, that's a great question. If anybody knows the more technical answer about how that process played out, that, that please uh, jump in here. But I honestly don't know how that worked out. Uh, I know even today, Nebraska sometimes comes up in, in you know, national elections as a place where the electoral votes uh, might be split up. I think Maine is another state uh, from time to time where that's a conversation. Some, some of you may know more about that today, but uh, you can see this on the map uh, in different years in the past. I guess I have another comment. You know that um, groups like the League of Women Voters is working on the national popular vote to get rid of the Electoral College. Can you tell me about that? How, how far has their effort um, moved the ball? I guess I don't know for sure, yeah. but some, some states have voted to do that. Okay. But I'm quite sure that the Republicans are against it. So. Yeah. It's not going to go very far, but that that is the push for the League of Women Voters this year, the national the national league. Yeah. Yeah. And, and you know, I, I alluded to that I, again. I, I'm wrong about a lot of things. Just ask my kids. They'll tell you. Uh, but, you know, I, th I, I think if you're a small D Democrat and we have an audience of big D Democrats, but if you're a small D Democrat, there's just something disturbing about the persistence of the electoral college uh, mm -hmm. as a decider. Um, you know, states like Wyoming <laughs> right. uh, getting these extra, I guess, uh, uh, votes, if you will, uh, disproportionate to say, you know, one man, one vote, one woman, one vote, one person, one vote in places like, you know, uh, uh, California, whatever. It's like, you know, how should Wyoming get so much uh, clout compared to maybe some other? I, I'm just picking on Wyoming. Somebody may defend Wyoming. But uh, uh, and that's true when you look at the, the members of the Senate, you think of two senators from Wyoming uh, equal to two senators from California. I just like, oh, there's something kind of anachronistic about that. Um, your microphone here yeah the parties have switched switched again after lbj yeah because of the civil rights era. yeah yeah and that's that's the and everybody here is probably very well aware of it i assume that that's sort of the huge issue after the 1930s civil rights mm -hmm. uh and and you can really see yeah, you know, I mean, Martin Luther King, you know, for instance, was a registered Republican, right? But you can see under LBJ and, and by the end of the 60s before King's uh, assassination, 68, you know, the Democratic Party has, you know, embraced, we shall overcome, right? Uh, they've embraced that. So it, you can really see that uh, switching uh, yeah. after the 1930s through civil rights. Absolutely. Absolutely. 
Yeah. And I remember LBJ saying, we're going to lose the South doing this. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I would think our political science professor would have something to say. Herb? Uh, Al, Al has his hand up. Yeah. Go ahead, Al. Go ahead, Al. Yeah. I, all the things are changing now due to the nature of the Republican base. We think of the Republicans today as being the party of big business uh, and you know the party of, of wealth and the privilege and Democrats being more in the nature of the common person. And it seems to be, and, and also uh, Democrats being more pro-government. That seems to have flipped completely from where it first started in the 1850s. So I was wondering how that happened. And, uh, you know, what, was the party of Lincoln the party of business? Uh, that's the part that really puzzles me. Mm -hmm. yeah, most, most of Lincoln's uh, platitudes in the election of 1860 uh, sort of represent uh, the argument over the issues of anti-slavery. Uh, and, and, you know, when they talked about business, they, they, they kind of addressed, you know, industrialization in broad terms, but, but there was no real conversation about subsidies for railroad companies <laughs> on the stump in 1860. And, and we know that during the 60s, the Republican Party, when they had control of the Congress during the Civil War, they pushed through subsidies, land grants, and so forth, to railroad companies. So that's in the 19th century, you know, big business writ large, railroad companies, there's nothing bigger. Uh, at the time. Uh, so you can see that thread for Republicans, I suppose, uh, supporting big business uh, to the end of the 19th century. You know, many of the railroad magnets of the 19th century are sort of closely aligned with the Republican Party in general. Um, so I guess you could say Lincoln, the rail splitter from Illinois, <laughs> Uh, you know, had a positive view to industrial development. Uh, but again, in 1860 and in 1864, those issues about, you know, big business are probably backgrounded to the larger debate over slavery and anti-slavery. And I mean, I, I don't want to be too, I guess, uh, uh, professorial. I can't help it, right? Uh, but, uh, you know, when, in my classes, I sometimes talk about, you know, one of the challenges for understanding Lincoln is, you know, to remember that he was a politician. So if you take different quotes of Lincoln, I don't think he used Twitter, but if you take different quotes of Lincoln, he seems to be saying different things at different times, right? So in, in a stump speech in Illinois, he may, may say something a little bit different than he does, say, when he's president of the United States or he's at the Cooper Union in New York City. So, you know, again, it's a different time, uh, but it, it's, it's very difficult sometimes to pin Lincoln down because we can forget this. He was a politician uh, after all. Uh, but but he generally speaking, you know, favored you know, industrialization and economic development. And, and he did have right, as president, he signed the Pacific Railroad Bill, which you know provided a lot of land grants for transcontinental construction uh, of the rail system that you know culminated, as everybody knows, right, in, in the late 19th century, beginning in 1869 with uh, you know driving of the Golden Spike out in Utah and that sort of thing. That's good. Yeah, that's good. But I, you know, I, 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 I'm probably trying to make excuses <laughs> uh, as a historian right, for the fact that the past doesn't always make sense, right? Um, you know, the past is a foreign country. Right? It doesn't always make sense in today's terms. Um, but, but Lincoln was a politician. David and Carol, did you get your question answered yet? Well, I was going to point out that Tom Southall had a question in the chat, just asking about the the photo book you mentioned earlier: "Free Soil, Free Labor, Free Men." Uh, what era specifically is that is that geared toward? What does it cover? Yeah. Oh, I love the question. Um, Foner's book goes up until. 1860 or so. He has a few quotes from Lincoln during the Civil War. I think I, I stole one or two of them in my in my chat here. Uh, but really, he ends it with the Civil War, right? Uh, the the subtitle, right? You read, you know, these history books. I can find my camera there. There it is. Uh, the subtitle here is the ideology of the Republican Party before the Civil War. Uh, but Foner would come back to the free labor ideology in. A Pulitzer Prize winning book that he would write a little bit later, uh, called just simply called Reconstruction, 
Reconstruction. So he comes back to the free labor ideology in that book, published a little bit later. Um, uh, this book uh, was, uh, I think, originally published, I think, in the 1970s. Uh, I've, I've used it. In, I haven't used it lately, but I, I used it. Uh, yeah, 1970. The first edition was 1970. I've used it for uh, in past classes. It's becoming for students today. It's like, you know, you know, boring. <laughs> but when I was a student, I was like, oh, this is so interesting. Ideology and and uh, symbolism and, and political discourse. I mean, I loved that when I was a student, but, you know, maybe it's a little bit different today. Um, but but uh, Heather Cox Richardson, um, you know, she will claim that, you know, what got her started in her dissertation when she was a graduate student was Foner's work. She wanted to, in other words, continue <laughs> Foner's study beyond the Civil War. And, and so in a way, right, uh, Heather Cox Richardson's book is, is sort of taking that thread and is stretching it a little bit further, maybe to the point which is no longer recognizable as a thread. Uh, but uh, certainly you can see it in the 20th century too. Uh, what is the labor question, right? Uh, how, will you, uh, how will you live as a worker? How, how will you make enough bread uh, to feed one's family? These are these are, you know, almost eternal questions that, again, today, maybe we, we bury them in our political debates, but it's still a fundamental one that uh, uh, we have to address. The labor question, right? Did I miss a chat question there? I think, I'm not sure. David, Mallory, if you could check the chat for me, because when it dumped me out a minute ago, oh, I lost all the chat. Oh, Kathy, uh, Kathy, oh, sorry, yeah. Can I say Herb has had his hand up for a little bit. Did you want to weigh in and then maybe uh, Pam? Go ahead, Herb. Reading this is a discourse upon the development of the Republican Party's Civil War and after. Would you like to bring in some comments about the about two related issues, which are not isomorphic, they fluctuate on their own. Um, immigration and international engagement. Let's say from 76 onward, um, because that's when Henry Cabot Lodge, the famous isolationist, got the first PhD in any field uh, for work done in North America. And it was in political science, by the way. <laughs> Excellent. Excellent. Well, thank you for teaching me something. I, the, the, the Democratic Party, uh, let's say in the late 19th century, uh, tended to be, right, tended to be, not, not, not always so, but depending on the president, you've got Cleveland's a little bit of an internationalist, but, but the Democratic Party tended to be more isolated in their view to the world. Democratic Party tended to be more open to immigrants. Again, there are exceptions, but you, know, you look at, I talk about the kind of party uh, bosses, if you will, the boss system in places like New York. You think about uh, Tammany Hall is, is strongly identified with the Democratic Party in the state of New York. And generally speaking, I mean, generalizations like, you know, Irish immigrants and others, you know, are rallying, you know, to the support of Democratic candidates, as long as the boss, you know, George Washington Plunkett or William Tweed or whoever says vote this way. So generally, and, and then on the opposite side, the liberal Republicans I alluded to are reformers. They tend to be a little more skeptical about immigrants voting. They, they talk about that immigrants aren't yet ready for full citizenship sometimes, right? They have a, and that's ironic when you think about Carl, Carl Schurz, who's a German immigrant uh, from, from uh, Missouri, uh, but, you know, traces back to Germany. You know, the, the Democratic Party and then the liberal uh, Republicans, you know, are, are sometimes kind of just dancing all around the issue of immigration, but tracing the Republican Party to its roots in the 1850s. And those people called the know nothings, they were strongly anti immigrant. I mean, that's what the know nothing movement, uh, mm -hmm. if nothing else, uh, advocated was high bars for immigration tight restrictions for newcomers. They call themselves sometimes nativists uh, or Americanists. This was a popular term for the know-nothings was the American party. So they, they were for immigration restriction because they believed in some kind of a, the language was sometimes, if you look at pamphlets, this is the kind of history I, I'd love to do, but I really don't get 
get to do that, but read pamphlets from the 1850s. You find these old pamphlets and, and they have all these kinds of allegations about the Pope and, and the Catholic conspiracy and, and all the rest. And so a lot of the know-nothings were buying that conspiracy. But again, the Republican Party is it galvanizes around the free labor ideology, the conspiracy they, you know, uh, tend to focus on mostly over time then is the slave power conspiracy, right? That the, the oligarchs from the South are trying to, you know, take power for themselves and to try to spread slavery uh, throughout the union. Uh, that, so that's the thing that they kind of rally around. But uh, yeah, you know, it's the it kind of dances around after 1876. Sometimes the Democrats seem to be more welcoming to immigrants. Uh, that's that's not always going to be true. But uh, like in 1896, when I, I mentioned uh, when I looked at the map with uh, William Jennings Bryan as the Democratic nominee and the populist nominee versus William McKinley in 1896. Uh, the, the Republican Party in that election was far more welcoming to immigrants compared to the Democratic Party. Uh, I mean, I, again, this is stuff you can read, but Brian and, and some of the populists had rhetoric that, that uh, has been claimed to be very anti-Semitic. You know, Brian's claim about the cross of gold, this his famous speech that he repeated over and over, do not crucify, do not press down upon the brow of labor. This crown of thorns, do not crucify mankind upon a cross of gold. That was Brian's speech in 1896 that he repeated over and over again. There's, a, a, I guess, a, sort of a reference here, crucifixion, uh, the, the, the crown of thorns into the gold standard, all this sort of idea of international bankers and Jews behind the scenes pulling the strings. I mean, there, there's a subtext there. Uh, and there, there were people in the populist and Democratic Party, you know, that, that, that pushed that argument about the control of gold and Jews as a conspiracy. They push that a little bit more strongly. So, so there is a threat of anti-Semitism there. All right, Pam, I think you're next. Yeah, Go ahead. Yes. Dr. Lucabell, I wanted to recommend Heather Cox Richardson's daily emails, notes from an American, and I get the free ones. You have to refresh my memory is where she teaches. I, I don't remember. Boston College. Okay, yeah. Uh, the, but, fine, the fine old institution, not downtown, but uh, about uh, 30 miles <laughs> in the suburbs, uh, right. Jesuit school. That's a, an old Jesuit school. Right, and it, it's, um, she writes a lot of history but she and she also explains what happened yesterday and it's the first email i get it's like at one o'clock in the morning <sighs> so it's it's very, she's very clear on how she writes herb i think i saw you shaking your head did i get something did i get something off matter but boston college is most definitely downtown in boston <laughs> On top of it, um, <laughs> what's that neighborhood called? Um, I, I used to know that. Uh, see, Boston University is downtown. Boston College is just Boston a. Boston College is still also downtown. Well, it's, it, 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 it's. I think it's about three or four miles from downtown, because it, it's it's more directly like from Harvard Square out than being downtown. I took the I took the MTA and he didn't much. <laughs> Dr. Looking Bill. <laughs> Dr. Looking Bill, you it's can you check with your, you can check with your student Andrew Donaldson, who is now in Boston. You were one of his favorite professors. So, uh, he can help me with my troubled geography, you know. Uh, <laughs> oh yes, he was a geographer, but he yes. he now is a, a, a avid history reader. So Excellent. anyway, I send you greetings from him. Well, thank you. I, I hope he's doing well. In the chat, um, yeah. Kathy writes, um, if she reads correctly, the year Hayes won the presidency, the Democratic candidate won the popular vote, but lost the Electoral College by one vote. She's just interjecting that there in the chat. Right. She has trouble, trouble getting the video activated. So, Yeah. Yeah. And, um, you know, in 1876, you know, the, the, the national election, you know, again, presidential elections seem like they come along, I don't know, every four years. Is that the way it works? Uh, but in 1876, you know, a lot of the debate in the presidential election 
you know, um, was centered on Indian affairs. Right? That's the year of the little big horn. Uh, mm -hmm. You know, Grant is is connected to that, obviously. So so too uh, were other figures in the Grant administration. And so the debacle at the Little Bighorn occurred in June of 1876. And of course, it hit the newspapers in July of 1876, about the same time as in Philadelphia, New York, they're celebrating the, the centennial of America's birthday, right? So 1876 is a, is a fascinating year. But, I, you know, a lot of the attention during the election cycle was, uh, was kind of focused on these other things. And then whenever the votes start coming in, and then you have these disputes in certain in certain places. I, I mentioned Florida and South Carolina and elsewhere. Those disputes over counting the votes were the thing that dragged out uh, the decision until, of course, the compromise or bargain of February. It was made in February of 1877 uh, between members of an electoral commission, um, almost evenly Democrat and Republican. But there was one more Republican than Democrat, and that made obviously a difference in the way the electoral co uh, the electoral commission decided on uh, the counting of the votes in 1877. So the results weren't decided till right before the inauguration in March. In those days, uh, I'm, I'm probably just telling you things you already know. But in those days, the inaugurations of presidents didn't occur until March. Uh, it, it's not until FDR. Uh, that the move was made from March to January. Um, so you know, they're kind of waiting to decide who the president is. And it's, it seems odd to us today. They're still, they still don't know in February. Well, that's because the inauguration doesn't happen until March. Mm -hmm. Great. Uh, David, I see that your hand is up. And I, I think unless someone's got a burning issue, um, we'll let that be the last question because we're creeping up to one o'clock here. Uh, okay. I, I was going to bring back a, a Another comment that Kathy Jensen made earlier that right. I totally agreed with, uh, she said, I thought your free labor ideology was referring to. Whoops, you've got. <laughs> oh, something there. there it's my, uh, yeah. Free labor provided by slaves. Uh, looking at it from the capitalist point of view, oh, capitalist, free labor is labor I don't have to pay for. But that always confused me until recently yeah. when I realized that, oh, no, free labor is from the laborer's point of view. You're free, or you mentioned independent to move to other jobs or do something else if you want to. You're not a slave to that person. So that was a neat, I, I think she was just asking for clarification there. Yeah. It sounds like she had it figured out. Uh, spot on. And, and and I think historians love to use these phrases sometimes just to confuse people. Uh, but when you think of what's free labor, right? Ironically, it's the most unfree labor of all. Unfree, <laughs> that is, you know, uh, an enslaved person not receiving any compensation for a lifetime of toil. Uh, that's free labor and it's unfree. Free, free only for the employer. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Oh gosh. Well, this has been a really uh, great talk. Uh, thank you so much for being here with us. Um, yeah. Many, many hands clapping. I see there on the screens. It's been, just fascinating. Appreciate you sharing your expertise with us uh, today. And, and I'm, I'm going to look at a Boston map more closely. Uh, obviously, <laughs> obviously, I've never been to Boston College, so I've been to the Cheers bar. That's about it. Uh, well, there you go. Got to have your priorities. Well, Boston. the world will not cry if we lose Boston College. Her, her, you're, you're not. <laughs> oh, Mary Jo. So I can tell by the look on Mary Jo's face. She does not agree with you, Herb. <laughs> All right. Um, well, I'm going to go ahead 